Okay, now let me um, see a very large number of people. One of the things we like to do at these symposiums is, of course, feature our own humanities faculty. And so you'll get a chance to do that now. And I'll introduce everybody very quickly. You can find out more about each of the participants in your brochure. But the, the point of this session is to do some very rudimentary work and then follow it with a more um, analytical uh, period of discussion. We want to make sure we get all the children on the table. You've heard about Alice. Almost uh, nobody ever gets to hear about Ethel. You know, there's sort of a hierarchy of notoriety in the Roosevelt family, but we thought it would be useful if we all sort of got on the same page about the Roosevelt. So we're going to go down from Alice to Ted, and Ted to Kermit, and Kermit to Ethel, and Ethel to Archie, and Archie to Quentin. But here to help is Amy Verone. Amy Verone is at Sagamore Hill. She's one of our partners in our digitization uh, project. Uh, she's the chief of interpretation there and, and, and does the curatorial work. She knows the collection as well as absolutely anybody. She's one of the nation's leading resources on Roosevelt and Roosevelt-related questions, particularly for Sagamore. So Amy, we're so glad you're here to represent Sagamore. You've all met the animated Stacy Cordery. Uh, Gary Cummisk will be representing Kermit today. He's an associate professor of geography here at DSU. Stephen Doherty will be representing Archie. He's an assistant professor of political science. Frank Varney will be representing Ted Jr. He's an assistant professor of history. David Meyer is the, is the chair of the social sciences department and a professor of history. He'll be representing Quentin and Betty Boyd Caroli, who you'll have a chance to hear again this afternoon, has agreed to, to help with the daughters. She'll be representing Ethel. So she's written the great book, The Roosevelt Women. You'll have a chance to hear her lecture right after our luncheon. So welcome to all of you for this session. What we're going to try to do is take a few minutes for each of the children and uh, get some basic material on the table. Uh, Stacy, I'm going to start with you. You may uh, want to uh, be quick since you've already had a chance at Alice, but just lay the table for Alice. Alice um, married Nick Longworth, as I just told you, and then became a kind of a political uh, advisor of sorts, certainly not a close one and not an important one, but she and her father had politics in common, and so until he died in 1919, they had a much closer relationship, and the joke was that Alice was more frequently at the White House after she married and didn't live there than she was when she actually lived there. Um, and then uh, Alice will, as I said, in 1912, when TR makes his um, third party bid, she will be torn, sort of heart and body, as she put it, in, in that uh, troubling uh, time, and will eventually decide she's a progressive and support her father's cause and work for it as much as they would let her, because they kind of shut her down and wouldn't let her use her celebrity. But then TR dies, and she is a, um, She's called the commander of the, I mean, the colonel of the battalion of death. And this is the group of Americans who fought to make sure that the United States stayed out of the League of Nations, which was um, the kind of the precursor to the United Nations. And they were successful. They were victorious. We did not ever join the League of Nations. Alice will um, then be adamantly opposed to American entry into World War II because she thought World War I was a terrible tragedy. She said everything that has happened before and after is just, uh, are just bookends to the great tragedy we call uh, World War I. So she wanted to stay out of World War II. When Pearl Harbor was bombed, she got on board and then, of course, um, you know, supported the war effort. She will write a syndicated column. Um, Alice uh, wrote a newspaper column that was a kind of a counterpoint to her cousin Eleanor's My Day. So the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a column about her social and political events, and Alice wrote a column that ran simultaneously that was critical of Eleanor and Franklin and their political and social events. Um, she wrote her autobiography. She said she needed to write this to get money because she needed money for her daughter, um, uh, Paulina. Paulina will uh, will die after she. Paulina will get married to a man who is also an alcoholic and not very good for her. Paulina will uh, then die. It might be a suicide. It might not be a suicide. And Alice then took her granddaughter Joanna Stern to raise. And jo I will say that Alice was a much better grandmother than she ever was a mother. So, but the main thing that Alice did all these years, 
uh, was to be at the kind of epicenter of Washington's social and political life. And her home was the gathering place for politicians and artists and scientists and foreign ambassadors and all sorts of, of people who came to kind of get the scoop, to learn what was happening, to see and be seen with Alice. And she really was a political celebrity to the day she died. And let me just, uh, I mean, I know it's very basic, but TR had two wives. Uh, Alice is the only child by his first wife, Alice. Uh, all the other uh, five children are by his second wife, Edith. Um, and, and just one last question for you, Stacey. W w was the paternity issue a public scandal during her lifetime? The paternity of her child was not a public scandal because the other group of people who came to her poker parties and her drawing rooms and so forth was uh, newspaper reporters. And so she was very close to them. And of course, it was a different era and this just wouldn't have been spilled. Although the newspaper reporters knew about it, there were many jokes. The big joke was that um, Alice's, what Alice was the name, her daughter Deborah, as in D-E-B-O-R-A-H, Deborah of Bora, as in Bora's kid, get it? Uh -huh. <laughs> The other big joke was, what does Nick Longworth, uh, no, let's see, what does a brand new parquet floor, like wooden floor, and the Longworth baby, what does, what does the new parquet floor and the Longworth baby, what do they have in common? Nothing, not a, not a Nick in either one of them. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't really public because Alice was who she was and she could keep this secret. <laughs> I just reported Fair enough. <laughs> Glad we asked. All right. Um, Frank Barney, you represent uh, Ted Jr., the third of the Teds, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., uh, T.E., R. Theodore Roosevelt, and Ted Jr., uh, the eldest son of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying, Stacey, I really like the slide of Nick Longworth. Um, and I, the fact that a man with no hair could be America's most eligible bachelor <laughs> proves what most middle-aged men believe, which was that hair is vastly overrated. <laughs> Part of my topic as well is, is growing up Roosevelt and the idea that young people always are trying to find some ground upon which to stand, some identity they want to establish for themselves. And the children of famous parents always have a very hard time with this. And think how difficult it would be to be the child of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, this is, uh, my students are familiar with this analogy, but to me, being with Theodore Roosevelt must be like hanging out with Robin Williams. You know, this endless stream of energy, this nonstop being on stage, this constantly being the center of attention, uh, and then having to deal with the fact that no matter what you want to do, Father's already done it, and he's done it brilliantly. You want to be a politician? Well, Father's been President of the United States. You want to be uh, a military officer, he's won the Congressional Medal of Honor. You want to be a diplomat, he's won the Nobel Peace Prize. You want to be a historian, father's written several books. You want to be a rancher, he's done that. You want to be a hunter, his exploits are world famous. Whatever you want to do, you're trying to live up to this impossible standard. And then think how much worse it is to be Theodore Roosevelt Jr. To not only have this example of this famous, indomitable, parent with this endless stream of energy, but to also have to live up to the name. Now, Theodore really did a pretty good job. Um, one historian has described him, I think, rather uncharitably as uh, being uh, not a handsome man. <clears throat> and the same historian said that he had his father's ambition, but he lacked his father's intellect. Again, not very charitable, but he actually did pretty well. He did go to Harvard, uh, though he did have a breakdown while he was there. Uh, but he got excellent grades. Uh, when he finished at Harvard, uh, he, he married. He and his wife named Eleanor, uh, not the Eleanor Roosevelt you're familiar with. Uh, she uh, and her husband were very much overshadowed at their own wedding by the presence of uh, T.R. and 500 of his former Rough Riders. <laughs> by the way, I will, I'm going to refer to the son as Ted, just to distinguish himself from T.R., uh, or the father's T.R. Uh, he uh, worked. He knew how to do hard work. He worked for two years in a, uh, in a carpet factory earning uh, seven fifty a week. He also worked on Wall Street uh, around a lot of men who hated his father. <clears throat> he went into the military. Uh, I'm going to read something to you. I want to make sure I get the quote right. Uh, he said that father, had, even before World War I broke out, father had discussed with us military training and the necessity for every man being able to take his part. 
Ted, every man should defend his country. It should be a matter of law. Taxes are levied by law. They are not optional. It is not permitted for a man to say that it's against his religious beliefs to pay taxes, or that he feels it is an abrogation of his own personal freedom. The blood tax is more important than the dollar tax. It should not therefore be a voluntary contribution, contribution but should be levied on all alike. Ted went into the Army in World War I. He served as a major. Uh, he ended the war as lieutenant colonel, the same rank his father had held. He was shot. He was gassed. Uh, he ended the war walking with two canes, uh, but still in the Army. He won the Distinguished Service Cross and the Silver Star. Uh, he used, his fa he used the, the military as his father had done as a springboard. He went to politics. Uh, he was elected and then re-elected to the New York State Legislature. But he kind of torpedoed his own political career uh, when he campaigned, didn't run against, but he campaigned for his opponent, uh, FDR's opponent. When Cousin Franklin ran uh, for office in New York, Ted uh, worked against him. Alice said uh, that it was because they, they, FDR was not the right kind of Roosevelt. I think they viewed him as sort of a maverick, sort of a playboy, rather uh, effete. Uh, the fact that he liked to go sailing, where his father liked to get out there and row and sweat. Uh, so this unfortunately did not work at all in Ted's favor. Uh, when he later ran for governor of New York, FDR's wife, Eleanor, uh, actively worked against him. And they tried, she and the Franklin Roosevelt's tried very hard to tie Ted to the Teapot Dome scandals of the Harding administration. Ted had been uh, ambassador, or governor general of the Philippines and of Puerto Rico during the administration. So his political career was pretty much up. Uh, when FDR was elected to the White House, someone asked Ted uh, what his relationship was to the president. He said, fifth cousin, about to be removed. <laughs> and he was. He was uh, removed as uh, Governor General of the Philippines. Uh, during, there was no place for him in the New Deal. Uh, he worked as a Vice President of Doubleday and on the Association of, on the Board of Boy Scouts of America. He also had founded the, helped found the American Legion. He could have sat out World War II. Uh, but he chose not to. Uh, his son, he and Eleanor had a son, Theodore, another Theodore Roosevelt, who was a Navy flyer in the Pacific and uh, was decorated. But Ted went back into the military uh, with the 1st Division. He served, uh, ironically, my father-in-law actually fought in the 1st Division as well. He, uh, Ted served in North Africa and in Italy. And uh, by the time the D-Day invasion rolled around, his health was not good at all, and he was not going to be permitted to go ashore with his men. He made a couple of uh, requests, verbal requests, that he was turned down. He finally filed a written request. He was permitted to go ashore. He was walking with a cane by that time. And he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, I'd like to read the citation to you. For gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty on 6 June 1944 in France, after two verbal requests to accompany the leading assault elements on the Normandy invasion had been denied, Brigadier General, yes, he was a Brigadier General, he surpassed his father in that. Brigadier General Roosevelt's written request for this mission was approved and he landed with the first wave of the forces assaulting the enemy held beaches. He repeatedly led groups from the beach over the seawall and established them inland. His valor, courage, and presence in the very front of the attack, and his complete unconcern at being under heavy fire inspired the troops to heights of enth enthusiasm and self-sacrifice. Although the enemy had the beach under constant direct fire, Brigadier General Roosevelt moved from one locality to another, rallying men around him, directed and personally led them against the enemy. Under his seasoned, precise, calm, and unfaltering leadership, assault troops reduced beach strong points and rapidly moved inland with minimum casualties. He thus contributed substantially to the successful establishment of the beachhead in France. And he did this, folks, while walking with a cane. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie The Longest Day, uh, the actor Henry Fonda portrays him in that movie. Uh, however, Ted didn't know he'd won the Medal of Honor because uh, six days after the invasion he died peacefully in his sleep uh, of a heart attack. He was 57. His wife once said that to her, her famous father-in-law, Father, I don't know if you realize this, but Ted always is afraid he's not going to live up to you. And T.R. said, not live up to me. I hold my head higher because of him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gary Kuminsk is an uh, associate professor of geography here. He's participated in previous symposia. Gary, you've chosen Kermit. Give us a little sketch of Kermit Roosevelt. 
Well, it certainly is an interesting family indeed, and many of the children follow in their father's footstep or respond in a reactionary way to their father. I think that he was, uh, he, set, he set a guiding principle for many, and uh, certainly Kermit, in many respects, follows in his father's footsteps, not in every venue, but in some venues he actually excels his father. Uh, finishing Harvard in two and a half years, uh, graduating with honors as his father did, but even faster. Uh, he showed a propensity for languages that exceeded that of his father. Uh, he was more successful in business than the elder Roosevelt. Uh, so in some respects, he stood his own ground and had his achievements that excelled those of his dad. Um, my interest in Kermit was his interest in natural history, that he entered uh, willingly and uh, engaged at Sagamore Hill and rowing with his father and explorations of the woods and woodsmanship, um, gravitating towards hunting. And as a matter of fact, it's arguable that Kermit first comes into the public eye in the years after, well, to a great extent, in the years after the Roosevelt administrations as, as president. Um, he accompanies his father in 1909 on their famous hunting expedition to Africa. Um, while there, learns Swahili and is able to speak with the porters and the people who are working uh, with the expedition. Um, he was an avid reader, as was his father. They transported literally dozens of books and read and reread them several times on the journey. And uh, one book that they read was the Oxford Book of English Verse from the 1912 edition. And the commentary on one of uh, Kermit's writings indicates that the elder Roosevelt lamented the lack of American poetry. There was some Walt Women's in there and that sort of thing. I remember having looked through that myself and thinking much the same thing before I read this. And Roosevelt, the elder Roosevelt, committed much of this poetry to memory, and they also looked at the Oxford Book of French verse and could read and recite in French. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, in a subsequent journey, after the um, att attempt at trying to regain the White House and journeying on the river, what, what was the River of Doubt that became the Rio Roosevelt, uh, named in Roosevelt's honor with a tributary named in honor of Kermit, they also brought a large number of books and uh, read in uh, Greek and French and uh, as well as uh, literary works in English. And most of the communication between Colonel Rodon, who was the Brazilian representative on the journey, and the elder Theodore was in French because they both spoke rudimentary French and were able to communicate in that way. Kermit, however, had assimilated Portuguese tongue and was able to communicate with those present. This amazing capacity that he had for language is evidenced when he also participates, as did Ted, in World War I. Uh, preceding the American involvement, joins the British Army and ascends to the rank of captain. And in what was then known as Mesopotamia, which we now know as Iraq, and Within two months, he had mastered Arabic in written form and in verbal form, and was, became a major translator for the army. Um, he became involved in the American contingents, of course, once the United States entered the war, also attaining the rank of captain, and uh, played a prominent role in that venue. He was involved in intelligence, as was you know, his his. His family continued in that tradition, uh, his son later, um, involving uh, planning for the war in Iraq in the 1980s. The, um, in, after the war, he becomes a, a, a prominent businessman uh, involved in developing the Roosevelt Steamship Company and the U.S. lines, which were ocean liners would transport people across the Atlantic. Uh, there's a dark side to his story, too. He had a, a constant uh, struggle with depression and alcoholism throughout his life. Uh, it enlarged his liver. Uh, he joined, as he had in World War I, he joined the British Army in World War II, preceding America's involvement in the war. Uh, 
in part through the intercession of their family friend Winston Churchill. Uh, he became involved in the U.S. effort, but his health forced him out in 1941. He came back to the United States, disappeared at times for long periods. FDR actually went, sent uh, the CIA looking for him to bring him back and reunite him with his family. And he was eventually posted to an intelligence post in Alaska. And during that time, in 1943, he committed suicide. This was covered up. And I talked to his granddaughter yesterday, and she didn't even know about this. The, the family didn't know the, the actual true circumstances of his death for close to 20 years. So this struggle with alcoholism was part of the Roosevelt legacy as well. And perhaps the... Um, when we think about people in manic depressive states and people who struggle with this, some of their productivity may be tied to that manic phase. And we certainly see that in Kermit's high level of productivity throughout his life. But he himself, um, as his father, became a noteworthy writer and not to the same, he didn't achieve quite the same fame but was involved in producing several books. And I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, but Gary, let me just ask one follow-up question. Um, TR dies in January 1919, so Kermit was 29 or 30 years old at that time. Uh, were, was TR aware that his son had a problem with alcohol? Actually, yes. Uh, when they, he was at the Groton School, he had an incident with alcohol that I found out through contacts with the family, and uh, they were very worried about Kermit. Uh, Kermit, Edith claimed that, that and, and has said in several, several places that Kermit was her favorite son, and uh, this is, um, there certainly seemed to be some degree of favoritism and some pecking order and hierarchy. Uh, he masked this pretty well, and he was I guess one of the points that I should have made about Kermit also is that in the Journey on the River of Tao, uh, which was published, the account was published in Through the Brazilian Wilderness in 1913, and of course Candace Millard more recently, her book has uh, retold this tale. If it hadn't been for Kermit, Roosevelt probably would have died on that journey. He even withheld his own quinine, his own medicine <laughs> for his malarial condition to keep his father in better shape. So. Uh, he was able to tough it out. He struggled in the true Roosevelt tradition uh, and told his father he would bring him back dead or alive to keep his spirits up. And indeed, they were successful. They uh, arrived emaciated when they returned to New York. The elder Roosevelt had lost over 50 pounds. Uh, Ted, uh, not Ted, but Kermit is largely responsible for the survival and the continued legacy, post-presidential legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we go to Ethel, the second of the Roosevelt daughters. Uh, Betty Boyd Caroli will be talking right after lunch. You've been sort of on uh, short notice invited in to represent Ethel. Tell us a little bit about the second and least well-known child of the Roosevelt. Yeah, I was curious which picture you put up. I have a, I'm going to be very brief because I'll talk more about her this afternoon. And uh, I want to concentrate now on the White House years because I would nominate Ethel for the, the prize. I mean, she was a perfect White House child. If you look at it, she was born in 1891, so by the time he be, her father became president, she was 10 years old. She had that sister, Alice, that we heard so much about. She had these two really imposing older brothers. She was pretty close to Kermit, but she was the most solid, the most steadfast the most unruined by publicity of any White House child, I think. And I've written about a lot of them because I also wrote a book about uh, First Ladies. I got an email this morning from somebody doing an article on White House children. I guess the current batch has uh, generated a lot of publicity asking for my ideas on what made a good White House child. And I think my answer is going to be to read about Ethel Roosevelt because it seemed the publicity did not uh, taint her at all. She, she went to cathedral school. You heard that her older sister, Alice, refused to go to school at all. Ethel enrolled, performed beautifully, and so forth. Her mother relied on her in a, well, when I talked to her daughters, because of course she was dead by the time I did my book, but I talked to both of the older daughters, and they kept saying how much Ethel's mother relied on her, really pushing her beyond her years, for example, I had a letter written when she was about uh, 14, I guess, 
Uh, her mother sent her from the White House to Sagamore Hill to open up the place for the summer. That meant, you know, controlling the budget, taking care of a large staff, and so forth. And there's this kind of pitiful letter from, from Ethel back to her mother in Washington saying, the butcher's bill this week was $34. Do you think that's too much? And her daughter said, you see there how she was really pushed beyond her years to be a very mature person. She had a, a, well, this afternoon I'll talk about what turned out to be a very sad life, really, that uh, her, her son died. But she's a remarkable person, and I just think that of all the children, I put Ethel up for the prize. And before, okay, you, this afternoon. before you pass off the microphone, can you just reflect a little on the relationship between the two sisters, because that must have been extraordinary. Well, there were one. And I know I enjoyed uh, Stacy so much this morning because I thought she and, she and I both were at a meeting in Washington with uh, people who knew Alice well. And they talked about how she, she put on this public, for example, Christy Miller, who took us around that evening, said that once she was at Alice's house and they were going out, and Alice took a long time to put on her hat and said, the image, you know, and then she walked out. But with the family, she was never like that. There was none of this show off. And the letters between the two sisters, as we heard this morning, especially in the later years, are just so loving and so kind. The family could always depend on Alice. Uh, first of all, she had quite a lot of money. You know that story about uh, T.R. said to Edith, we have to be nice to Alice because we may have to borrow money from her. <laughs> and sometimes they did. And she always came through. I mean, there, there are so many letters between the two sisters, needing one needing help or one offering support. It was a very warm relationship. It was also a very loving relationship with Kermit. Uh, they're the closest in it. Well, they're two years difference in age. And Kermit is, uh, maybe they were more alike in personality. But um, Ethel is, uh, she deserves a book of her own. Somebody should write a biography of her. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Doherty, uh, you've chosen what has emerged as the black sheep of the family. Um, Kathleen Dalton said he was the black sheep, and uh, Stacy confirmed that in the sentence this morning. Tell us a little bit about Archibald. Yes, Archie has uh, Archibald has already been mentioned several times, not in the most positive light. Uh, he is perhaps the most controversial of the Roosevelt children, and I, I promise I will give Archie his due, but I, I kind of wanted to do something, just spend a minute. Uh, about the issue of presidential family members. I'm the political scientist here, so in some ways I kind of like these, these topics. I could give like a one hour long, I think, uh, lecture on presidential family members right now. As a matter of fact, I think I will. There'll be a, there'll be a quiz later, I hope you take it. I'm just joking, of course. Uh, but uh, I think presidential family members is, is a very interesting topic, a very useful topic, and it's one that I think ties in very well with Roosevelt. As Kathleen Dalton said yesterday, that uh, Roosevelt transformed the American presidency, and he did. That's why he's such a significant president, why I'm so happy we do this, uh, this seminar as a political scientist, because he really did kind of create a new presidency. And I think thus his family members were kind of the first of uh, you know, the first presidential family members we really you know, uh, think a lot about uh, because the presidency has grown tremendously uh, in its significance and importance and Roosevelt is right on the cusp of that. Roosevelt is right at the point where the president, uh, presidency is emerging as this very, very significant leadership office. We don't think too much of presidents before Roosevelt other than Lincoln and Washington. I mean, you can think of people like James Buchanan, Franklin Pierce, James K. Polk. You don't really think that much about these, or you don't think, think they were that significant. And Roosevelt kind of ushers in this period of a very, very significant presidency. He also is the first president to like market himself and uh, gain a lot of attention from the media and kind of develop this, this tremendous persona. And it kind of fits his, his personality quite well. Uh, so he kind of redefines what presidential family members are about. In just a broad sense, I think presidential family members, and there's some literature uh, available about this, uh, kind of come in two stripes or two types, uh, either decorations or extensions. And we think of decorations are those that are just sort of ceremonial figures whose presence 
kind of humanizes the president. Uh, they can be like attractive positions to appear, people to appear with the president. Uh, they kind of have this decorative aspect. And I think uh, we've seen examples of kind of family members who have been very sort of decorative. We can think, of, of course, of the Kennedy family, those iconic photographs. So the children playing underneath the Oval Office desk. This is happening at a time in the baby boom generation when there's you know, large families everywhere. And here we have a president, a younger president, with these, uh, these children. And this is like a wonderful decoration for Kennedy. It kind of humanizes him. And I think the Roosevelt children have that sort of, uh, sort of uh, quality as well. We could even think of the current president who has two young children. I think this uh, calls attention to the fact that Barack Obama is younger than a lot of the presidents we've had and appears to come out of a different generation. So they have this sort of uh, humanizing, decorative quality that some people like. I think a presidential family member can also be an extension or someone who acts hand in hand with the president to make important decisions, who acts as kind of the personal assistant, as kind of a, a leader of someone who has that uh, quality. And I think you could think of perhaps Hillary Clinton as someone who kind of shared almost a nearly co-equal level of influence, or maybe not, but uh, close to with, with the president. That, of course, creates some controversy. Some people are happy with this. Others say we, we don't elect these family presidential members, so why should they have this influence? Uh, so I think they can either have those two qualities. And Roosevelt is so significant at this point to uh, uh, to kind of look at presidential family members and look at, uh, at, uh, at uh, uh, Roosevelt's family. Now Archibald. So as I said before, Archie, uh, controversial, is the one who does sometimes receive some very critical... Excuse me. <laughs> uh, anyways. Uh, but... Uh, so Archibald, a uh, little background on him, and I will defer to the fine scholars, the Roosevelt scholars here, if, if they wish to weigh in on some of these uh, significant events. Uh, but he's the fourth child of uh, Theodore and, uh, and Edith. Uh, we get a picture of a young man who was raised very much in the Roosevelt model, the strenuous life. Uh, and he even appears to have a, a bit more of kind of a rebellious quality or kind of very aggressive quality, or he seems to kind of copy that aspect of his father. I can think of like three uh, little snippets of information, little accounts of Archie's childhood. Uh, one of him throwing uh, snowballs at reporters or throwing snowballs at someone. Uh, another uh, story is that he carved his name in a church pew of his name and his favorite teacher's name. I have my students do that all the time, by the way. I'm ta <laughs> tagged all over town. I'm just joking, of course. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it does give you this, this indication of this sort of rebellious a rebellious child, and there's a more serious incident. Uh, all of the Roosevelt children went to, and I'm pronouncing this right, Groton Academy, and uh, he was expelled. Uh, apparently, according to the Patricia O'Toole biography, he sent some sort of uh, message to a friend, calling it, he was out west with the Roosevelts doing his, uh, you know, kind of that strenuous western life, and he sent a, some sort of a letter back saying to a friend, how's everything at the old Christ factory, he called it, and he got expelled for that. At least that's the account, uh, and he ends up finishing up at Exeter Academy, uh, like the other Roosevelt children. Uh, when he's in college in Harvard, he apparently, uh, he kind of began to sense this sort of aggressive quality uh, he, uh, this is 1915 uh, or 16, World War, World War I is happening. Uh, we're not involved at this time. We only enter in 1917. The uh, dean of Harvard, the president of Harvard, the leader, uh, is very much uh, wants to keep us out of the war. And I guess uh, Archie begins to find old uniforms and broomsticks and starts to have uh, the students march around and kind of in preparation for the, uh, for the war. And this, of course, uh, causes him some flack with the, uh, uh, with the president. So you get this indication of uh, the president of Harvard this, this indication of this rather kind of aggressive uh, person, and uh, he serves with distinction in both World War I and World War II. He goes to World War I, uh, serves courageously, is injured, a grenade, I guess, image, uh, damages his leg. Uh, in uh, World War II, he uh, enlists back, he doesn't have to, he's in his late 40s at the time, and he's re-injured. He goes right into New Guinea, one of the most physically demanding theaters, and is injured again. I think he, I think it was mentioned he was like the only American who got 100% disability in both wars. So obviously someone who served his country and uh, rather uh, you know, risk, uh, took that risk. Uh, so at this point, you might be wondering why is he so controversial? Why, uh, why does he kind of getting this, this, why does he get some of this criticism? Well, it has to do a lot with his politics. Uh, after the war, and perhaps before the war, Archie uh, appears to embrace some very far-right causes, some very, very conservative politics. 
Uh, we kind of get a little bit of foreshadow of this. In 1932, while working at the Standard Oil Company, where he works, he's an executive there. That's, of course, the Teapot Dome scandal that's been mentioned. He wasn't implicated, although he did, I believe, testify, but he was not implicated in any sort of uh, misdoing. Uh, he joins a group with Herbert Hoover in 1932 that suggests that the, uh, the, ballot, the budget can be balanced with, uh, uh, by cutting back the benefits to veterans. Uh, this, of course, if you know about the, the uh, bonus march and things like that. This is indicative of kind of a very conservative business-oriented approach uh, that's in some ways um very sort of uh, goes against some of the people who supported his father, at least some of the political beliefs of his father, at least we think of Roosevelt as the progressive, or Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, after the war, he joins several right-wing organizations. He joins the John Birch Society. As you know, this is a strongly anti-communist organization. He joins this group, and he is very public about criticism uh, of, of socialism. He supports kind of the McCarthyist approach. He, he criticizes a lot of people who are reputed to be social. And uh, uh, he's very open about it and sort of very caustic about it. Uh, he even will make comments very, very critical of the civil rights movement as he associates it with uh, socialism and communism and uh, uh, disloyalty to America. Uh, an African-American gentleman named Ralph Bunchy, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, actually receives a Theodore Roosevelt medal. It's a medal named uh, uh, for his father uh, for public service, and Archie is, is not like that, and is very vocal, and even makes some comments that uh, I think obviously can be interpreted as racist, and other comments, I guess he said, uh, he makes a comment about uh, African-Americans not having some of the intelligence to deal with technology and some other, uh, other, other weaknesses he found in that group. So obviously, uh, these are controversial opinions, and especially today, we look back at these in, in sort of a very negative sort of way, and that's perhaps why Archie gets some of the controversy. So we have kind of a dilemma, I think, with Archie. Uh, how does the uh, son of a, someone we assume to be a progressive, someone who had a, TR had a lot of ideas, uh, some of them we really much consider to be ahead of his time, he was a progressive, he, he did advocate a lot of the programs we, 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 uh, we have today, you might remember the, uh, uh, the, the lecture last night where they mentioned that Social Security, unemployment, things like that, uh, are kind of a, the Theodore Roosevelt legacy, how does uh, uh, one of his offspring become so, uh, so far to the right and so perhaps different than his father. I can only kind of, uh, you know, kind of speculate about perhaps what motivated Archie to have these particular feelings. Uh, one of which could be that uh, I loved Frank's presentation about how uh, it's tough to be Roosevelt, how your father has done everything already. What can you do? Uh, perhaps embracing these, these policies, these, these uh, kind of embracing these very ideologically defined uh, positions, uh, perhaps gave Archie a chance to uh, assume the mantle of leadership in his own view, or to perhaps at least have notoriety, have some sort of uh, prominence, uh, have some sort of uh, chance to kind of be part of the national discourse in ways that perhaps we, we don't admire today. So that perhaps uh, could be one speculation. Uh, it could also be said that maybe that uh, Archie kind of uh, associated himself with some of the Roosevelt legacy that perhaps uh, we don't quite so admire today, but uh, we're still there. Uh, maybe kind of the nationalistic quality of Roosevelt. Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt was a nationalist, uh, and and perhaps Archie's uh, very strong opposition to socialism, or as he saw it, was perhaps part of that. He thought of the socialism as a internationalist sort of uh, ideology, one that did, didn't uh, have you identify with being American first. And his, his father definitely was kind of this sort of uh, kind of patriotic nationalistic individual. Uh, we also perhaps can look back at the 1950s from the people, from the point of the people who lived there. Uh, the Cold War was at its height. There was a concern about uh, you know a communist take over the world. Perhaps uh, uh, today we, we look at these as kind of extreme, but for the time perhaps they were uh, perhaps sort of a, a more understandable on that level. Uh, so that could be one speculation. We can also realize that Archie uh, was very active in the business community, was very successful in it, associated with a lot of executives, with Standard Oil and other places. And perhaps this was part of his just uh, grand embrace of capitalism, business, and uh, these ideologies that talked about government regulation, government control of the economy. He just did not agree with and found kind of a threat to his, his belief in business and capitalism. Once again, this is different than his father, uh, of course, who you know, was the trust buster and the progressive and things like that. Uh, or perhaps a third possibility was simply that Archie was uh, uh, just had a particular personality that lended itself to extremes. Uh, we've heard uh, several kind of comments about uh, maybe he wasn't the brightest guy, or maybe he had a certain kind of a certain type of personality. Uh, some of the accounts I've seen in autobiography suggest that he was kind of an arrogant uh, uh, military officer who uh, treated his. Uh, 
uh, yeah, his, his, uh, his troops as kind of little kids, like uh, he was an older brother, they weren't very smart. He was apparently very generous with them, uh, but sort of had kind of a, I guess kind of a contempt somewhat, or wasn't very positive about that. Uh, uh, he was identified as a bit of a prude and a snitch at Harvard, uh, where he, uh, I guess, was uh, kind of not the most popular person, seen as someone who kind of reveled in power and kind of the ability to control people. So perhaps, uh, not knowing the gentleman, and perhaps not being an expert on some of the fa facts of his life, perhaps maybe he just had a certain sort of personality that lent to this, uh, uh, this type of behavior. Uh, but uh, we do remember Archie more than the other uh, siblings for kind of the, this controversial sort of kind of ideologically extreme type of, of politics. Uh, he dies in 1979, lives quite a long life, gets married, has a, kind of a normal life, but apparently during this entire lot time is still kind of voicing his very, very uh, strong and perhaps ideal, very ideologically divined uh, criticism of American politics and things like that. Uh, so I hope perhaps you understand Archie a little more. Uh, he doesn't seem to be getting uh, a lot of respect. He uh, seems like he's kind of the sign of degree of the group or um, Spencer Pratt or I don't know, whoever's unpopular right now, uh, but uh, perhaps he, he had some aspects that are uh, quite worthy of noting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. That takes us to, to Quentin, the youngest, the sixth of the Roosevelt children, David Meyer. Uh, give us a little sense of uh, Quentin, says T.R. called him. Well, that last comment that uh, Stephen made about not getting any respect uh, made me think just briefly that Quentin perhaps had something in common with Rodney Dangerfield because he was on the other end of the extreme. As you've had a chance to hear the uh, comments about the uh, children, there is a fair amount of overlap. There is the uh, Groton School, there is going to Harvard, there is the, uh, the environment at home, which is uh, relatively complicated, as you can tell. Yet, I have to say that when I've tried to peruse, without getting stuck on particulars, uh, Quentin's history, um, if you think of the letters that Kermit edited and published in 1921, and there were actually uh, many more letters, there are about 2,000 that are associated with Quentin, as an individual, though, he almost seems to be uh, one of those exceptions that I think kind of sheds a particular natural what if question about uh, his father, but also a what if about uh, himself. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, Quentin, of course, uh, I'll work backwards just another step, will die before his 21st birthday flying a, a French aircraft, a Newport, uh, against a collection of uh, Fokker D7s, I believe they were. And uh, when his life comes to uh, that rather tragic and, and swift end, uh, it seems as though uh, the information about him uh, would unfold a little bit further. So now, now let me take, take you back and go the other direction. The comment about, uh, or comments rather, about the presidential children and the uh, attraction uh, they represent for the media. Quentin provided every conceivable form of entertainment for the press that I can think of. Uh, the idea of uh, vandalizing uh, presidential portraits in the White House, carving out a baseball diamond on the presidential the White House lawn without, of course, permission. Uh, throwing snowballs uh, at individuals would have been the least of his offenses, but none of which ever comes across as uh, malicious. Uh, the idea that his father would refer, refer to him and his friends, one of which was the son of uh, Taft, uh, as the White House gang. And then you get these other little tidbits that begin to creep into the description of Quentin when he's still young, uh, as the individual uh, that would have pillow fights with his dad before his dad short thereafter has to go out for some uh, official presentation. Not so much the pillow fight alone, but the fact is that apparently TR enjoyed it as much as Quentin could possibly enjoy it. And I seemed to, and I don't want to suggest that I'm anywhere near the expert of uh, our, our, our panelists, yet as I extract something from uh, the writings and the style and the playfulness, and another feature with respect to Archie, Archie was sick, 
Quentin took Pony inside the White House, not with permission, by the way, uh, and up to the uh, uh, room where uh, Archie was apparently bedridden just to cheer him up. Uh, you have a rather peculiar kind of, 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 of kid who seems to be playful, fun-loving, I would even venture to say doing the kinds of things that T.R. probably loved and would have done himself if he could only have said to himself, I'm, I'm only six, you know, and gotten into that mode of thought. Now, I say uh, all of this because I'm, I'm leading up to another slightly different twist on the idea of trying to deal with living in the Roosevelt environment. If I think in terms of a guy who, let's say now, comes from that more happy-go-lucky uh, sense of personal freedom environment, uh, now he's going on to college. Uh, the war is clearly uh, on the horizon. The discussions are part of uh, headlines uh, practically on a daily basis. Yet at that point, I, I would stop and say, wait a second now, we're talking about somebody who just is in the middle uh, of, of that year when he would eventually turn 21. Uh, I'm thinking of that time when, uh, now when he dies, uh, I'm going to work backwards again. Um, he goes in in 1917. Uh, but the idea, though, you've got a very, very young kid here. And I think that in this case, if he's operating on the ideals of his father, I would argue he's probably operating on the ideals of his cohort at Harvard, of his friends, of his colleagues. Um, and his father may have played a role, but this is a, a very independent, but a very comfortable individual with who he is. And perhaps I'm giving him uh, too much credit, but I get the impression, he reminded me as I read about him, uh, a great deal of our students here at TSU that we have, who are in that young cohort, who are uh, going to, or were going to Iraq, uh, and who knows where they're going to go in the future. And when I think in terms of their attitudes and their backgrounds, uh, and I grew up with this uh, you know, in the military sense, being near Scott Air Force Base, yeah, I, think, I think that there is a part to say that they are caught up in the times, that it's not just being the son of or the daughter of, but it's also uh, being in an environment where those items are discussed, not imposed upon you, you're not forced to take up this mantle, and in this case, he doesn't have enough time in life to develop alcoholism or any of the other maladies that appear to afflict the others. Or at least, that's what the limited exposure I've had to the uh, evidence that I could find uh, would suggest. Now, with respect to this individual, you do have a collection of, of, of little mythologies that I'll sort of alert you to. Uh, and it's hard to distinguish which one is true and which one is not, although some of them sound more plausible than others. Uh, when he was on the front lines, uh, if we recall that he's flying a French plane, uh, and he's flying uh, a relatively slow plane, um, he's also on the cutting end of technology of the time. But I'm emphasizing the plane just for a moment because when you're talking about the flyers of the First World War, you're talking about a very unique mentality. Uh, of, of individuals who are not simply on the cutting edge, but individuals who are, are willing to take risks uh, that you and I would probably think uh, beyond foolish, and many people would have held that opinion at the time. Yet that fits perfectly with a youthful attitude towards getting out there, uh, a sense of almost medieval honor going with the uh, experience. Now, the mythology components uh, begin with how many planes he fought against. One said that the Red Baron shot him down. That's probably not true. Uh, it's more likely, according to the trends, that he was shot down by a Sergeant Gumbra. Uh People don't want to think that an NCO shot down an officer, probably, or presidential son. But I would suggest that one has to recognize that the German Air Force functioned a little differently uh, from the French or the American Air Forces as they emerged, the Army Air Force at the time. There's also the, the question of what happened when he died, another piece of the mythology. Uh, this one's probably closer to true, that when he crashed, and according to the record, was shot in the head twice, um, that uh, a German photographer took his picture and transformed it into a postcard. 
and that was considered to be a, a very distasteful act. Yet the other side of that same story is that when it was realized uh, who he was, that over a thousand German uh, uh, soldiers showed up for an official funeral for Quentin, uh, it suggests, of course, uh, an entirely different attitude. Now, I think the reality is probably both, uh, because I did get confirmation that such a postcard did exist, uh, but I haven't been able to actually find an indication of just what it was in the case that maybe there was another one out there uh, than the one that was alleged to have been a picture of uh, him uh, lying next to his aircraft uh, in dead. So with that, uh, I, would, I would simply suggest that with Quentin, we have uh, also uh, an ideal, a more idealistic vision of a child that seems to have lived a life that I would call much closer to normal and with a certain attitude of helpfulness towards others, uh, the classic sort of good syndromes that we'd like to find uh, in any individual that we would run across, uh, but he never got a chance to really explore much of his uh, long-term options given his untimely death. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Amy, I want to turn to you, Amy Verone. You have the most uh, enviable position of all. You get to work at the house and have unlimited access to the house. There, there are two personalities, at least, uh, that sort of belong on this stage, too. T.R., whom Edith often regarded as the seventh Roosevelt child, and the house. The house seems to be a more of a, of a personality and a presence in Roosevelt's life than in the lives of, of most other people. Uh, first of all, let's just go to the quick clerical question. Um, do you know, do, are there copies of this postcard that exist? Oh, yeah. We, we have copies in our collection. And, and the, the picture very sh clearly shows, you know, the crashed airplane and, and the body laid out beside it. And not to be unpleasant, but you can very clearly see he was, he was killed in the air. He was shot up the head and the plane crashed. So um, Quentin's death, you know, as I talk about mythology, one of the things that, that I have always found astonishing is that um, people collected parts of the airplane and sent them to his mother. And you know, for us, we're just like, why are, would you do that? Uh, but on the other hand, his mother and, and you know, his family re regarded that as sort of a physical sign of, of his sacrifice. And she displayed that in her lifetime. It was out in the North Room. And when we redid our exhibit, somebody, or we put in a museum exhibit, um, we focused most of the house Talk, talking about presidency, and so to have um, the axle to the, to the airplane in the north room is something that happened after TR's death. Um, but instead of putting it in storage, we put it in the exhibit because it was important to the family, and it's it's an important part of the part of the story. We we have a very unique opportunity at Sagamore Hill. Um, we don't tend to think of the children as grown. You know, not to say that we live in the past or that we're, we're communicating with the dead or something, but when we talk about the children or the family, we talk about them, unfortunately, maybe, as, as though we do know them, so they've just stepped out. And, and uh, if anyone's had the opportunity to visit Sagamore Hill, one of our greatest assets is that the Roosevelt family was so generous when the house was transferred after Mrs. Roosevelt's death to the Roosevelt Association, we, we got 90% of the original furnishings. And so if you come to the house and you walk through uh, the halls and you look in the rooms, you're seeing the rooms as the Roosevelt saw them. Um, they're overly tidy. I'm sorry, it's a curatorial thing. Uh, I like to go in to some of the rooms and uh, move things around. It drives my staff crazy. Uh, we have a nursery set up and, and their blocks are always very tidily stacked. So I'll go in and I'll like kick the blocks across the floor and it's, it's like there are mice. You know, you go back two minutes later and, and they're all neatly stacked again. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting to listen to you guys because you have such a perspective of the family sort of outside Sagamore Hill. Um, and it's not a family group. It's not eight people interacting exclusively. Um, there are five other Roosevelt households on, on uh, the Oyster Bake area. And uh, my favorite line, I think it might have been Alice, who said that the children flowed between the houses like water. 
And they were part of 16 uh, cousins who lived and were raised on Kovnik. And, and just as Betty pointed out, that they, they were sort of paired uh, as children, that they also all had little pals uh, to play with. They, you know, 16 kids, there's a lot of uh, way to make little groups that interacted. And their fathers uh, very much made a point of trying to give their children the, the childhood that they had grown up with. Uh, and Kathleen talked yesterday about how T.R. tried to recreate his childhood. Um, but it wasn't just T.R., it's his cousin Evelyn, his cousin John, who are organizing uh, relay races. They, they sort of organized summer sporting uh, tor tournaments where they would have uh, tennis tournaments or they, they would have uh, relay races in the barns. They went on these marathon rowing adventures where you know 25 people would pile into a lot of rowboats and then go out on, on Long Island Sound for adventures. Um, there's a great story about Alice happily celebrating that she, when she was 16, uh, coming in and announcing that she had beat her uh, nephew, or I'm sorry, her cousin Oliver at tennis. Uh, her siblings promptly made fun of her because uh, Oliver was only nine, you know. <laughs> so it's like, woo, you yeah. know. Yeah, great, you should have beat him at tennis. Um, so the way the family interacted um, was, is, is very much something that we try to understand and, and to follow. Um, I think, you know, with, with Quentin, he had the advantage of, of only being four and a half when his father uh, became president and uh, didn't really have any awareness of what was going on around him. You know, the, that Alice and Ted actually did a happy little dance together uh, when McKinley was assassinated. Archie apparently burst into tears because he was worried that someone would shoot his father. Um, Quentin was definitely the most, I think Quentin and Ethel were the two easygoing ones. Ethel, you know, um, the TR used to write what he called picture letters. He would illustrate, he would add these little cartoons. Um, and Ethel liked to dominate the two younger boys. That there, there was this one wonderful one where there's one cartoon figure of a boy laying on the ground and there's another cartoon figure of a boy getting his hair pulled by a cartoon figure of a girl. And the title is Ethel Lays Down the Law. So um, she had a very unique part uh, in, in the family, I think, because she sort of mediated between the older children and the younger children. She was the connecting point. Um, I think, you know, to understand the Roosevelt family, it, it is, it's not just TR. It, it's it's wider family. Um, we're talking about how his family enabled his president, his, his life, uh, but it's also that they, they enabled him to be a presidential uh, figure as well. That uh, his cousin Emlyn, who had more money, who lived next door, owned more property, certainly had more financial success than TR, traveled to Buffalo uh, after McKinley assassination and uh, told TR, he said, don't worry about the house, don't worry about the family. He basically took over running the Roosevelt uh, you know, TR's life, his financial life, he took care of his bills, he made sure a family was taken care of, he got this, the boys enrolled in school and all that stuff, because the family very much felt that they needed to free him up to do the best job he could as president. And, and it's interesting because it's very similar to behavior that their, their fathers had exhibited with TR Sr. And um, Roosevelt and Sons, you know, the manufacturing, or not manufacturing, sorry, the merc mercantile business that uh, made the family fortune in the 1850s. All four brothers were working there, but Theodore Roosevelt Sr., after a certain amount of time, did very little business work. You know, he still traveled occasionally, but he was mainly involved in, in charities and philanthropies. And a uh, society woman once asked one of her, his brothers, uh, you know, what are you doing to match your brother's charitable contributions? And his rather tart response was, what well, Theodore is our charitable contribution, <laughs> because they were carrying the load in, in the family business while he, he was out doing other work. Um, I don't know if I want to keep rambling, but... Uh, we'll get, we'll get, uh, just before we, I have a question for Stacy about gender, but before we go there, uh, give us a sense of the house. Uh, who slept where? Who, who's, who are in the same rooms? Who have their own rooms? How do the house dynamics work? 
The house dynamics are great. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Um, theater, uh, Sagamore Hill is a shingle style Korean <coughs> house. And I'm, I'm sorry we don't have a, a picture of it here. It's three stories high. The third floor is really uh, in TR's lifetime reserve for uh, mainly for the servants' quarters. Uh, TR does have what was indicated as to be a billiard room, but he actually used it as an office. Uh, Ted Jr. would later dub it the gun room because that's where TR kept his hunting equipment. Um, the first floor has a small hall that lets into TR's library and a drawing room used by Mrs. Roosevelt. It's got a large veranda, the piazza, as, as uh, Roosevelt referred to it. TR, I think his autobiography said that I wanted to live outside. You know, I had to live inside, but I wanted to be outside too. And for the family, they had a set of French doors that went out there. And in the summers, they would basically just live out on the porch as though it were a second living room. Uh, there are 10 bedrooms on the second floor. And I love it when, when TR and Edith moved into the house in 1867. You know, TR had a library downstairs. He had an office on the third floor. He had a morning sitting room in on the second floor off his bedroom. He had his own dressing room. And as the as the, the family grows, as the life grows, it, you know, life within the house grows, he gets tossed out of the morning room because they needed a nursery for the children. He loses his dressing room because it becomes Ethel's bedroom at one point. Uh, the upstairs gun room becomes the children's main play area. And uh, he made a comment to someone at one point that he's lucky he wasn't sleeping in a barn uh, <laughs> because he was just being crowded out. Um, there were 10 bedrooms, uh, but Ethel, I'm sorry, Edith sort of religiously guarded two of them. She kept them as guest rooms and just said, there's no way if I give these rooms up to family, we'll never have space again. Two of the rooms were used as sort of a baby control area. There were actually three of the rooms. There was a nursery and then uh, the gate room, which uh, had been TR's morning room. And they, they literally put a gate over the room, and Ethel would remember that they were kept there until they could be trusted not to fall down the stairs. Um, so that was sort of a, like a baby playroom. And then there was an, another room for sleeping, and that the nurses slept in there and the governess with the, the small children. It's great with the, with the boys. Alice is lucky, because Alice is the oldest. Alice got a room, and Alice stayed in her room. Uh, Ethel, because she was the only other girl, got her own room, too. The boys always had to share. And there was, there was sort of constant maneuvering for space between the boys. Uh, once it was clear their mother wouldn't let them have the guest rooms, uh, there was a large closet that Quentin claimed as his own and convince his mother to put like a little single bed in there so he could have his own room. When the governess finally left, when uh, Quentin was old enough to go to school and didn't need a governess or a nurse anymore, Ted campaigned and, and got uh, his own room up on the third floor. So it was Ted, it was a cook, three maids, and a scullery maid. Uh, I'm sure the women were delighted to have a 14-year-old boy move upstairs with them. Uh, but he at least was happy because he had his own space finally. And when he married and moved out, Archie immediately moved into his room. When Alice married and, and moved out of the house, Kermit immediately moved into her room. There's this constant sort of land grab going on. And um, there's a great story in uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Ted Jr.'s wife's memoir, uh, she spent her first summer at Sagamore Hill in, in 1912, and she said she was amazed. She was, used, she was an only child. She lived in this quiet Boston household, and she said to come to Sagamore Hill with the Roosevelts, who were always so glad to see each other. They were always talking so loud. They stayed up late. They ran up and down the stairs, which didn't have any carpets. They talked loudly as they went to their bedrooms. And then they got up early the next morning and started the whole thing again. Um, she said that first when she lost 25 pounds and she learned to sleep under any circumstances. <laughs> Stacy, I want to ask you a question. You know, um, first of all, um, six children in 13 years, so fairly rapid growth of family. Uh, Edith had a couple of miscarriages during that period, too. Um, four boys, two girls. Um, I think Steve said earlier there are some commonalities. Uh, Harvard Groton, of course, that's true only of the boys. Um, and looking at Alice, 
and talking about her similarities of dynamics and energy and intellect to her father. I know this is a what if sort of question, but how might the life of the Roosevelt's been different if they had lived in an era when women had more opportunities to express themselves than they did in the early 20th century? How might things have been different for Alice? Uh, for the family, uh, the dynamics of the family, but also Alice's own frustrations. Well, uh, of course, I think the, the obvious answer to your question would be um, if there was an equal playing ground for schooling and opportunities between the boys and the girls, that maybe <coughs> Alice's innate natural talents would have come to the fore. Maybe Ethel would not have submerged her own um, dissatisfactions in travel, because she traveled a lot, seemed to be happier when she was traveling. Um, so maybe they could have taken on um, more substantial work and been happier as individuals. In Alice's case, though, she said that she never ran for public office because she was shy. And so maybe that shyness was not the truth. Maybe that shyness was a kind. I've always thought of it because People don't believe this when I say this. So I, and I really didn't believe it the first time I heard it. So I really pressed her granddaughter and said, well, come on, Alice Long was shy. She said, Grammy's shy was, shyness was the kind of shyness where if she walked into a room full of people like this, and when she walked in, she was Alice Longworth, then she'd be fine among millions. But if she walked into a small group of people like this, and she was one of several, but not Alice, then that was hard for her. Alice was not the sort who could slap backs and kiss babies. But maybe if there had been opportunities for schooling, opportunities for her to use her political uh, acumen in other ways, she and Ethel would have had happier lives. That is a what if question, though. I, and maybe Betty's got a different answer. Well, it seems to me. Oh, your It seems to me also it's a matter of class because, as I'll yeah. say this afternoon, the two sisters of Theodore were against the vote for women. Yep. But they had no qualms at all about having Senator Lodge for dinner and telling him what he should do and writing their brother and giving him advice. So I think it's always strange to me, but it, it's definitely a class idea. They didn't need the vote because they were having dinner with, dinner with the president and the cabinet members. The way Alice tells it um, often in her life, it, it was sort of five against one, that she felt like an outsider, marginal, never fully integrated into the family, called baby Lee, called sister, and so on. Uh, let's talk a little bit about family dynamics. In any family of six children, there are floating alliances, there are natural affinities. Uh, one question you might say is, how do you, what kind of Roosevelt do you choose to be? In, in large families, people choose to take on certain aspects of the family dynamics or reject them. Uh, Betty, can you start by just talking a little bit about how this all worked on a on a day by day, month by month, year by year basis of this large rambunctious family. I think it changed a lot over the years. I mean, um, because we all know uh, when you're 10 years old, a four year difference in age is a lot, and when you're 44 years old, it's not very much at all. So in the White House, as we all said before, you you got these alliances, and the boys were off at school a lot, and then Alice was doing her thing. Later, it really it really does become you know, the alliances change. Apple and Archie were prime. I mean, the letters, she thought he was a racist bigot, and she didn't want anything to do with him. Uh, there, there are many, many letters in the later years about that. In the earlier years, uh, you know, he was the little brother that she was bossing around. So the dynamics really do change over time. Anyone else want to talk about this at all? I, I think the family, you know, certainly as children, obviously, kids squabble. Um, but they also, you know, bond together whenever uh, opposition comes up. I, I think there was a lot of the usual give and take. I, I, I do think that she was more part of the group maybe than, than she would talk to publicly. I, I've always found with a lot of Alice's public writings that she frankly didn't care if she told you exactly what was on her mind. You know, that she wasn't going to reveal her deepest thoughts or or what was, what was deepest in her heart. And obviously, you had more experience reading um, her letters and such. But we, I find uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting for us is, is Alice had to go for six weeks or eight weeks every summer and stay in Boston with, with the Lees, um, her, her maternal grandparents. And there, there's resentment there that she's sort of missing out on things. She's missing out on what everybody's doing. 
at Sagamore Hill, or she was missing out on seeing the cousins. And so I think that was frustrating for her. You know, it, it's interesting because as adults, they're, they're so close. They seem to be so close, especially she and Ted uh, actually lived close to each other in Washington. And there, there's a great story, um, in, again, in Eleanor's book about um, someone, the whole thing with the Teapot Dome scandal is, is actually that Archie Roosevelt is, is one of the people who sort of said there's something wrong going on here and helped to sort of uncover and cause the investigation. Um, there had been some question because Ted was Secretary of the Navy at the time about whether he'd been in on this, this attempt to cheat the government by overcharging them for, for stored gasoline supplies. Uh, and, and some congressman got up and pointed out that Ted had owned Standard Oil stock. Uh, but Ted had, had always let Eleanor manage their money, mainly because he was serving in public office. And uh, he decided that this guy had insulted his wife and he was furious, and he was literally like getting dressed to go out and go over to this guy's house and punch him in the face. Eleanor called Alice and, and said, you know, he's gonna go get in such trouble, he's gonna punch this guy in the face, it's, you know, it's gonna be terrible. And so Alice was like, well here, get him, get him on the phone for me. So Ted comes on the phone and said, don't try to talk me out of this. And Alice said, I, I wouldn't think of it. He's, he's a jerk, he deserves to get punched in the nose. And I don't think the fact that he wears glasses should, should keep you from hitting him. <laughs> and you know, I don't think the fact that, that he's not really a very big guy, uh, that you know, just because he's scrawny, you shouldn't keep from hitting him either. And, and she knew how to manipulate Ted to the point that, you know, well, maybe it's not a good idea to go beat up some weakling because he couldn't say nice things about my wife. But, you know, he, she was able to, to keep him from, from something he would have been very focused on doing. Uh, when Nick died, uh, I think they were, they were in Memphis or they were somewhere in Tennessee, there's a story about that Ted and Kermit chartered an airplane because they realized it would take them too long uh, to get to where Alice was, you know, by train, so that they, but they rushed down to be with her in this time. And, and, you know, Alice always came home in emergencies. She's always there, she's always dependable. And Edith was thrown off her horse in 1911 and hit her head on the, on the Macadam Road, on Asphalt Road. She was actually like semi-conscious for, for three or four days. It took her that long to recover. And Alice like, makes a beeline from Cincinnati uh, to come home when there's trouble. So Any excuse to get out of Cincinnati. Maybe that was it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I can understand. But she also comes home after Quentin dies and yes. rallies right back to, the, to Long Island to help her parents grieve over Quentin. And, and you know, in 1909 and 10, when TR is in Africa, Alice comes and stays for, for five or six weeks. With Edith, you know, it was just Edith and Ethel and Alice in the house because the, the boys were either in school or, or in Africa, basically. So you're you're always seeing this give and take, and I, I think um, it, it's interesting to sit and listen to people who study them so much because you tend to have a more academic point of view, and I guess we we don't have quite that that removal from them. You know, they they are sort of the little the little ghosts at Sagamore Hill, uh, that they aren't there, we just have a place ready for them in case they want to come back. And, and so it's interesting, because we tend to, to dismiss the squabbles a little more. Hang on, just a second, just a second, Gary. Uh, we're gonna have some time for questions. We'll break precisely at noon, but go ahead, Gary. Well, I was thinking while we have these scholars in our midst, uh, I wanted to ask, what constituted the education of the Roosevelt women? Uh, how did that, exemplify their class and time, and when did that change? When did Roosevelt women and the family start pursuing more formal uh, credentials? I think the short answer probably is that no Roosevelt woman went to college until the 1930s. That's when it changed. With, um, for example, Ethel's two daughters, Edith and uh, Sarah Alden, both went to college. But I think I'm, I mean, I'm saying that I, I don't think there's any example of that because it was private, it was at home. Um, 
TR and his brother, of course, had tutors come in. The sisters could take advantage of that for a little bit, but then they got their own tutors. And they got a much heavier dose of literature and language. And the boys, of course, got science and math. And then they got Harvard after that. So no, it, it really changes in the 1930s. Let's see if there are questions from the audience for any or all of our participants on any aspect of Roosevelt family life, particularly the children. Yes, here. Uh, just the birth order, um, just as a, as a factor. Um, as a younger sibling to a, a brother who was a, a bright star, um, I, speaking in Archie's behalf, sometimes by the time we get to Archie, he's got two older brothers who sound like, and as well as Alice who's saying it, anybody look at just plain birth order? Yeah, and it's speculating about the birth order and its effect on the family. I think, I think Echo beating him up. Yeah. <laughs> Probably had an effect. But, but yeah, I mean, Archie's the youngest, but he's not the baby. You know, he's one of the youngest, but he's not the baby. And so I think that's probably, it was a hard position to be in. He, some authors refer to like his uh, attitude toward his, uh, the men in his command in World War I, that he treats them like little brothers, or even makes that comment. And thus, perhaps, you know, his personality is shaped by the fact that so many people uh, were kind of controlling him. I was the last of seven kids myself. I know what this is like. So he probably uh, uh, might, have, uh, might have shaped his personality and kind of uh, shaped the way he dealt with people under his control. The fact that he was so, I don't speculate that, but uh, that's probably a good point, yes. But because of the particular uh, situation of first wife, second wife, Alice, and the other five, are there two oldest children? Are Ted and Alice both the oldest child in some sense? I think so. I, I think Ted felt a, a real responsibility as the oldest son and, and the namesake. And, you know, I, I think a lot of, of Ted's actions, you know, that, that he sort of makes up his own mind at some point that he, that he is going to be his own man. And, you know, this, this idea that he got a job uh, in the summers in college, that he worked in a carpet factory. And he started on, on you know, the floor learning how to run a loom and over the, the several years worked his way up to management. And when he left Harvard, uh, the reason he didn't go to, to Africa with his father is because he had a, a job working in this carpet factory and he was sort of determined to, to make it on his own. Um, one of the things that's interesting, before he went into politics, he decided that he needed to earn money, enough money to be independent. And, and that he had a goal of earning $500,000 before he went into politics. And, and he, um, after the carpet factory, got into to stock brokerage and money management and actually moved to California. So it's like not only does he sort of follow his own path and, and create this independence, but he actually goes all the way to California to do it, where, again, it's sort of like I'm my own person. I'm the only Theodore Roosevelt in the state of California. And, and he did make that fortune, and, and that's why after the war, he went into politics. Betty, I want to ask you, you're, you're Ethel's advocate today, and you said that she's the presidential child exemplar. You know, T.R. famously got all four of his sons into World War I to the front, uh, very adamant that they will be warriors, but Ethel was the first one to go to Europe. Right, as I was going to say this afternoon, the very first one in the family to get to, into World War I was Ethel and her doctor husband, who left their infant child, I think he was about three months old, with her parents, and they went off to Paris. Um, so she was a pretty gutsy person. And they were, they were Red Cross, they were working yes, with the Red medical. Cross. Yeah, they worked in the hospital, and she worked as a nurse or an aide in the hospital, and there's some very good letters back to the family describing that. Right. Yeah, there's a very nice little anecdote, very, very brief, about Ted's wife, Eleanor, yeah. uh, in World War I. She uh, went to work with the YMCA uh, as a, was a supportive organization for the soldiers, and Woodrow Wilson's son did the same thing. This is while the Roosevelt boys are in, for, are in Europe fighting, and when TR was told that Woodrow Wilson's son had joined the YMCA to help the troops, he said, how nice, we sent our daughter-in-law. <laughs> so Actually, he said, we sent our daughter. Oh, you know, okay. didn't, it, Her daughter, okay. Yeah, family. Yeah, but again, this idea, this sense of responsibility uh, that, that all the Roosevelt women shared and all the Roosevelt children shared. Got just a little time here. Go ahead, speak up. Uh, have any of these family dynamics been carried on through subsequent generations? That's a great question. You know, we have friendships here with T.R. the Fourth, with Simon, with Tweed, and when you meet Roosevelts, you always, I don't know if you, if you feel it, but it's inevitable. You think, what part of 
tyranny that did they get? Where, what are they in this whole, this whole large, interesting family dynamic? Joanna's Sturm is Alice's granddaughter. And Alice was Theodore's daughter. And Alice did not have Theodore's photographic memory. But she could, Alice loved poetry with her brother. She, um, uh, she published a, a, the, a, the Desk Drawer Anthology. So the poetry runs throughout this family. But I have stood in Joanna's house and listened to Joanna and Alice recite at rapid fire speed the Battle of Lepanto that just, just you couldn't, and, and it's gargantuan long, and they did it so quickly and perfectly from memory and absolutely in tune, and it was an astounding thing. It was like being catapulted yeah. backwards in time. You know, th this is the, the, the pre-Twitter, pre-iPod, pre television, pre-radio generation, and they read books. They memorized poetry. They memorized long passages from, from you know, literature. And there are stories about Ted in, in Africa and in, and in um, France, entertain, you know, calming his troops by reciting, you know, uh, The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere or something that, that they could, and Archie, there are accounts of Archie doing the same thing. It's, it's obviously a Family and I have held Alice's uh, copy of the um, uh, Oxford book, yeah, of literature, and it is held together by string. Yeah. Tr himself could recite long passages from the Nibelungen Lied, which I don't think is much done anymore. <laughs> yeah, Alice could do that. Yes, go ahead. Uh, did any of uh, TR's family support FDR? I thought there was somebody that did. Did any of the? Uh, and, and how did the family react to that? <coughs> did anyone from the family support FDR, and how did the family react? Uh, Corinne, Auntie Corinne, it would be the sister, yeah, supported FDR and said she voted for him, but she died before he was inaugurated. She went to a party for Eleanor and got pneumonia and died before the inauguration. <laughs> <laughs> lightning, lightning struck her. Corinne, I think Corinne was friends with, FD, with FDR. They went sailing together and things like that. Archie, not so much. But you know, one of the um, one of Eleanor and Franklin's sons um, voted Republican, and Alice had got great measure out of that. Yeah. Also. And Kathleen had said that it was important for TR to get out of his class and, and mingle with average Americans. Did they do that for their children? They they did do that. Um, one of the interesting things with with Ted and Kermit is that. Uh, TR felt later in life that he sort of missed out by not going to public school and not developing those, those friendships. And uh, both Ted and, and Kermit, their first two years of schooling, went, went to Cove Neck School, which is a local school you know, for fishermen and farmers' sons, uh, not far from Sagamore Hill. Uh, they had several fights with some of the boys, but that was all part of the learning experience, apparently. And uh, you know, certainly TR, took his children west. They went on, on trips to the west, and hunting trips and just sightseeing trips. So he did try to get them out in the world more. Did the family get involved in, in, in the legacy of TR as a conservationist? The most money Alice donated in, in her um, last several decades was to conservationist efforts. Yeah, I, th I think all the family supports conservation efforts. I know that, that uh, Theodore Roosevelt IV is, is very involved in conservation and uh, in what he actually introduced the platform, I think in 2000, when George Bush ran uh, a, a, a environmental platform plan at the Republican Convention. Uh, they are active still. They, they tend to be active more privately than, than within government. What do we know about the, the, the family, the children and grandchildren and, and Mount Rushmore? Rushmore was carved after TR's death. I, I don't know. No connection there. There must I have mean, been some family members there at the dedications, and presumably, the, but no one has a thought on that. No. Yeah, they, they are certainly aware of the National Park Service. They were part of it. You know, Ethel and, and was the leading voice of the conservation, of the preservation of Sagamore Hill. Um, Alice supported her, and, and Archie was involved too. Uh, but Ethel really led the campaign, uh, both to get it preserved by Theodore Roosevelt Association and then 
when they decided to turn it over to the National Park Service. She was very supportive of that and, and worked uh, on that effort. Ethel, um, one of the things we've uncovered in the files at the Theodore uh, Roosevelt National Park, thanks to our work with uh, Valerie Naylor, is a series of letters that Ethel wrote to the Chief of Interpretation at the National Park uh, during the 1950s when it was a National Memorial Park. And she came out in, I believe, 1952 to spend some time here and to meet some of the last of the TR contemporaries and to um, see, see the park and to, and to, and to give it her, um, her, um, her support. And the letters are very charming letters. She writes and says, well, is there, is there anywhere to stay out there in North Dakota? And is, there a, is there a dude ranch I could stay at? Will there, can vehicles go in this park? And there's this long and interesting patient correspondence back and forth that she did come out in. There are photographs of her um, in Theodore Roosevelt National Park in, in 1952. The country was sort of gearing up for the centennial of Roosevelt's birth, and, and that was one reason that brought her out. So she remained active very much so in, in Roosevelt's West, and was the one family member who, who made physical journeys out here. Well, but Alice vacationed out there, yeah. you know, and she made sure to bring her daughter, Paulina came, they, and they stayed in, in, in two different ranches out West. That was really important. Now, how many living descendants are there? How many are involved in public life? I have no idea. There are tons of them. There are a lot, there are a lot of them. I don't, I don't have a count of the Roosevelts. Uh, many of them are involved in public life. Uh, not necessarily in elected positions. Um, I know that one of, one of the, Mark, Mark Roosevelt is the head of the Pittsburgh School District. Uh, a lot of them are involved, uh, one of Archie's granddaughters is a judge in the New York City uh, Family Court. They're involved in politics, but they, they don't. Well, Susan Weld. Yeah, Susan Weld, obviously, she was the wife of the governor of Massachusetts. But she's an amazing um, woman in her own right. And um, yeah. what's the Roosevelt in Chicago who got the MacArthur Grant? Oh, Anna, 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 Anna McMillan. Scientist. Yeah. Anna Roosevelt, right, got a MacArthur Award for her research on uh, Amazon tribes and how they're probably more advanced than they realize. That's a good sign. Um, <laughs> it's lunchtime. It's time to take a break and stretch. But let me thank, first of all, Amy, Stacy. Gary, Stephen, Frank, David, and Betty.